With your help, we can continue to fight for freedom. This is not possible without your generosity. Join our quest for the truth and our freedom. Simply visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash donate to make a difference today. You're on Reality Check Radio. It's Real Talk with Rodney Hyde. Remember, you can send me a text. Please do at 2057 or email me, even better, inbox at realitycheck.radio. We've got Christine Smith back. Remember the homeschooling, very experienced homeschooler who has a podcast and gives advice to homeschoolers from all over the world, from here in New Zealand. She's joining us now. I'm going to make Christine something of a regular, and I'd love you to email in your questions that you may have, queries that you may have for Christine to answer, that you might be thinking about homeschooling or are homeschooling and got questions for her. She's very, very experienced. And she's beaming in all the way from Thames, Oxford, England. We can say good morning, Christine, but it's good evening there, right? It is. It is indeed. Hello, Rodney. It's so lovely to talk to you. Well, I should say this. Your husband wrote a very amazing book that you were kindly enough to send to me, and it had a deep effect on me. I'm trying to think of the full title of the book. A Christian, a, what's it called? Man, it's a great book. A Journey in Christian Apologetics. A Journey into Christian Apologetics. My goodness, I read this book and I loved it so much. Is it able to be bought? Yes. Yes, absolutely it is. At the moment, um, there are two options. You can buy a Kindle version or a hard copy. You can get uh, the links to both through my website, the the comminghomeinfo.com. There's an Our Books tab in there. Well... It had a deep effect on me because it was like an intellectual inquiry into the basis of Christian belief. And um, every word has been so carefully chosen in that book, and you can feel it when you read it. And um, it's a short book, and I loved it. I so very much, it had a great impact on me. So thank you, thank him for for me from that and any any listeners that are interested in uh where's what's the web page again christine comminghomeinfo.com comminghomeinfo all one word dot com and you'll find this wonderful book there a truly wonderful book magisterial now <laughs> thank you how are you finding england uh chilly but we were expecting that. The spring is coming along and we are loving being here amongst all of this history. It is just blows us away. Yes. Just loving it. Because mm. you feel in New Zealand that it's just yesterday, isn't it? Everything's just yesterday. Yeah. Our old houses in New Zealand would be mid-1800s and the English just kind of smile when we say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you you told me before we came on here that you went to a church that had been a church and services there for 800 years. 800 years, yes, yes. Every Sunday, uh, the, people and, born, buried, married. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's quite a humbling or quietening experience, I found it, because um, saints, if you like, have worshipped there for hundreds of years all our forebears worshipping this same God who's the same yesterday, today, forever. And it just helps bring in perspective some of what bothers us about what's happening all around us now in the world. And it's still there. Here we all are. So yeah. it's I find it quite quite a way to help just help bring perspective. The latest headlines and worries don't matter when you think of it in that perspective. It's all happened before. (laughs) Now tell me, we're going to talk, we're going to have a series where we talk about homeschooling. And of course, I guess there's degrees of homeschooling because your children might be going to school, but you assist them. And in a way, that's homeschooling. And you take the opportunity to teach them. Or you might go the whole nine yards and teach them they don't go to school. Or you might have some days at home. So there's a whole degree. Whole range, but there's a great uptick. That's a modern word. There's an increase in interest 
and homeschooling. Why is that? I think what happened with COVID definitely created uh, a pulling up, if you like, of, of people's attention. They were homeschooling with no choice. Mm. And so, so you have that. But you've also got the growing awareness that too many of our children are coming out of school at the other end, functionally innumerate and illiterate. And that's just, that's criminal, actually. And so if that there's something you can do to mitigate that, homeschooling is one of the ways that you can deal with that issue that we have in the country. You often get a shock when you ask a young person, including your own children at times. I just had the shock with my son, and I spent literally a couple of evenings with him, and he's away. And you ask them to do something, depending on their age, simple arith arithmetic or spell a word or um, times table, and they're just completely lost and befuddled by it. Mm. And you think, oh, my goodness, I just assumed that I was getting you to school and you were learning. <laughs> Assume nothing. <laughs> it also strikes me. My observation, I don't know whether it's because I've got girls and it's different with girls, but I can't get over the level of bullying that occurs at school these days, despite all this talk about, oh, we have zero tolerance for bullying. The bullying and the inside and outside little groups and that you're on, you're my friend, you're not, get away from here. That's just, that's, I, I can't believe the nastiness of these students. Mm. Is it a new thing? I think it's always been around in some measure. It's probably, I'm guessing, it's more refined now because especially some of the, the little girls, that they, they're seeing how it's done with movies and TikTok probably and other TV um, media, yeah, other social media-based things. So um, I, I did have hope actually that with all of the, the concentrated efforts in schools to try and, and help the bullying, it, well, it'd be interesting to see some facts, but it doesn't seem to have made inroads to to helping to helping get that phenomena down, we'll say. Because it, it's it's just it's tragic what happens to kids as a result of it. Well, but and of course, the kids that get bullied are the fragile kids, mm. and uh, these damn phones and even laptops, because they message on laptops too. And I have been shown messages that young girls have sent out at night in their chat group and their friend group. And it's her, and honestly, goodness me. And I guess it's a loss of values, but a big reason that I've come across for homeschooling is kids getting bullied. That is one of the reasons why people will choose to come home and to do that. There are quite a few reasons, Rodney, as to why people would choose the option to homeschool. Mm. Uh, having a bad experience at school does factor quite highly. Mm. And so there would be some measure of, of um, trauma and having to de-school with the process after coming home. Other people homeschool just simply because that's what they've always wanted or they're alarmed about what they see or they don't see in the school. There can be any number of reasons as to why a family would decide to homeschool. Um, fortunately, in New Zealand, it's not a difficult thing to do, and it's our privilege to choose to, to bring our children home and to not delegate anymore. Can, in your experience, can homeschool, like, can any mum or dad or nana or granddad homeschool? Yes, absolutely they can. Um, people say, oh, not everybody could homeschool. Well, 
in theory, anybody can homeschool. Not everybody could or should, but for those who want to or have an interest in it, there is no reason why you can't. Um, I think the biggest thing for many parents is this, um, well, it, it's a mind game, really. We think that teaching is rocket science and we couldn't possibly do that. Or I'm not patient enough to homeschool or I leave it to the experts. But for the first five years of your child's life, what do you think you've been doing? Mm. You were homeschooling them. You, you taught mm. them how to use the potty. You taught them how to talk. And quite frankly, if you can potty train a child, I think you can teach them anything. Mm. So <laughs> homeschooling is is a very doable thing. And I think once you just get over that that confidence and start to see a glimmer of hope and let that little tender shoot that, yes, you can do it, grow, you're away. Yes, you mm. can do this. I homeschool for two terms, three children. And it was the most blessed time of my experience of my life. And I found it at times extremely hard, but I got to the point where I got very good at it. And in fact, the big problem I had was, what was I going to do with my kids? Because I had them at sort of like 10 during high school maths and English and then they decided that they'd like to pop down and try the local primary school for a, a week or two and I said well if you're gonna commit to that you know you sort of got to do a term and they've never come up to dad again <laughs> but my biggest hurdle was what I had in my mind was creating a classroom at home. And my thought was I'd be sitting up with a blackboard like, you know, Mrs. Smith and writing it on the blackboard. My kids would be sitting at desks and doing that for six hours a day. And I quickly discovered that homeschooling's nothing like this. And in fact, I called it unschooling, which I learned on the internet. And it just became literally 30 minutes a day of concentrated study, each child, on a good day. Sometimes it was 20, and some days it was none. But man, could they learn, because you realize they never get this one-on-one. -on -one. Mm. And I used to go to bed at night, and I'd be lying there with a puzzle thinking, I'm not explaining fractions very well. One, one daughter had trouble with fractions, and I'd lie there and think about how to do fractions. And my mother was still alive, and we'd get on the phone, and we'd laugh, roar with laughter, because we're trying to remember how we learned to do long division. <laughs> with the funny bracket, and how do you carry it, and where you write the carry number, and you think, how do you do that? And all that, we had, I had, I had, so much fun, and I discovered such a lot. Aspects of my children, because seeing how they learn is a big insight into their character, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. And it makes a different person out of you too. Did, did it, you notice that, how oh, it opened up your world? Opened up my world. I saw my world through a little kid's eyes. I saw the wonder. I saw the excitement of catching it. I had that wonderful experience of something not working and having to stop and then go away and spend literally time thinking about how I was going to explain it. But the biggest thing I learned was patience. Me too. <laughs> some, some days better than others. <laughs> yeah. And to relax. And then to mm. wonder what the hell do they do at school all day? Well, I, I interviewed Dr. Sarah Ferrant, and I know you have as well, yes. and she told me that the average learning time in a school, state, private, whatever, is one and a half hours a day. Yeah. What else are they doing? What and, else are they doing? Well, the rest and, is and, gender. 
Well, well, it's things like crowd control, taking the role, um, chatting in the classroom while the teacher's doing something else, but one and a half hours on average learning time a day. And, and if you think you can do that at home, in fact, you can probably nail it oh, easily in an hour and a half. Mm-hmm. So the concept, you know, when you said before that you, you felt you had to copy the way a school was conducted, I, it sounds to me like you were doing everything except ring the bell. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, no, that, to be fair, I never did that. I, did, I yes. thought that in my mind when I started, if you know what I mean. Oh, I do. I remember doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that's but that's normal because that's all we know of school. And in a new situation, we do default to what we know. So mm. you, as a parent, need to um, unlearn or de-school that kind of expectation you have, and just gradually learn that new skill. And it takes time, like any skill, before you're feeling more comfortable about being a little more relaxed. It's okay for her to read a book on the couch or. Mm slouched across the the lounge floor. She doesn't have to sit at the table. And Mm. once you start getting that concept in your mind, you're you're really over the hump. Yes. As as you wish. (laughs) I also, it's a good thing to know too, that you don't have to decide I'm going to homeschool full stop. And that's forever in a day, which was what I imagined. Whereas, in fact, it might be, in my case, two terms, or it might be a year. It doesn't have to be forever, which is another good way of looking at it. And my middle girl got such a jump start because she's dyslexic, supposedly. And we I discovered that homeschooling. No one else picked it up. And once, you know, you'd worked out that and figured she's not badly and how you overcome it and how you deal with it, um, she's been away, you know, with her learning. And um, every now and then she says, oh, I'd quite like to have some homeschooling time. You know, have a week off or something and just homeschool and, declutter because it's so busy the other thing I learnt was ah the thought just escaped me hmm well while you're trying to get that to come back to mind I can underscore what you have just said in that there is no one right way to homeschool you can come home for like you say a couple of terms for as long as what is necessary for you and your child. Um, It could be just a year. You could plan for it to be till the end of high school. Or you can just say, well, we're going to assess on a year-by-year basis. You don't have to lock yourself in. Mm. I remember what I was going to say. Mm. I found extraordinary resources available, and I got all the curriculum textbooks and Goodness knows, it's all just there. You can just buy it and access it and homeschool networks. And so I had, you know, the books that you work through for the various levels. And I concentrated on maths and reading and writing. And in the maths, what was great about it, because you're one-on-one, if they got something, you just turn the page. Because you realise at school they go over and over it. And if the kid's got it, it's like, I know this already, you know, and over and over. And then I'd discover things that they couldn't get. Like I said, I've got one daughter, very bright, she could not understand fractions. Um, And again, you realise that's the beauty of homeschooling one-on-one. I did the three kids sort of like one after the other, half an hour, half an hour, half an hour, and then they'd have them do other activities while I was dealing with one. And so you'd have this one-on-one time. And it was that ability to stop. And for some reason, they just have these hurdles. 
and you realize that that hurdle could mess them up for a year or two, you know, because they're in a class and they just can't, oh, I'm no good at maths, which is a terrible mm -hmm. thing that particularly girls say, right? What would you say to someone saying, oh, I'd really love to homeschool, but I'm just, I don't know what to do. Curriculum-wise, you mean, or going just about? Going about it. How do, where do I start? How do I get into this? It's a big thing. What if I screw it up? My kids miss out and it'll be all on me and I'll be responsible for my kid. They won't socialise. They'll be locked in their bedroom on Facebook <laughs> all day. What You know, like just that confidence. And, and of course, when we read about the exemplars of homeschooling, it's mum home all day, living the life in a lifestyle block with chickens and a garden and it's all looks so wonderful on Facebook. And then there's us, you know, stuck in a less salubrious environment, work to do, um, problems with husband, <laughs> whatever, you know? Yes. Yeah. Uh, how do, what would you say to that person thinking I'm very worried because my child's not enjoying school. I worry about what they're being taught. They don't seem to be doing particularly well. I wonder if I could help, but I'm scared. Mm -hmm. I would first of all reassure them that what they're feeling and worried about is normal. That's not odd. That That's a concerned, loving parent that's demonstrating the best motivation that there is to want to do something about it. And I think if if we wait until we get all our proverbial ducks in a row, we'll never get around to it. I mean, imagine if we had tried to learn everything we possibly, possibly could before we had our babies, all of the mm. what-ifs and all of that. We would never have got around to it. You you just got on with it and you learned as you went. You You mm. did do some theory, and then you soon found that theory didn't match the practicality of it anyway. But mostly you just choose, um, put your big girl pants on, feel the fear and do it anyway, and mm. know that there are going to be people that are going to walk along and support you in this. Um, so us normal people who don't have a little lifestyle block and, and everything looks tickety-boo on Facebook and Instagram – that's another error. Don't compare yourself to what you think uh, is successful homeschooling because it's going to look very different for each family. So in New Zealand, the first thing you have to do, uh, you need to have um, an, a certificate of exemption once your child is six. So you can homeschool right up to when a child is six and then you need the exemption. It is quite, um, to to apply for it, it's like writing an epistle, really. It's not a quick thing, and there is a lot to do in it. You you have to demonstrate quite a few things in it, and quite frankly, I think you should because you shouldn't homeschool on a whim because you're going to get some days that are really hard, and if you don't know that this is what you really want to do and that you made this really big effort to go through the exemption process, it's just raising the chances more towards just throwing the towel in. So the basic line for the Ministry of Education is, is that you need to demonstrate that you're going to educate your child as regularly as and as well as a state registered school. And what you're doing in your exemption process is, is demonstrating how you're going to do that. So if you just unpack that little sentence there, automatically you think to, to teach as regularly as a school, oh, that means you've got to start at nine and finish at three because that's what we think that means. No, it doesn't. Um, and if you're going to teach as well as a state-registered school, uh, with all respect and total respect, actually, to the amazing teachers that are in the system, um, they're, they're, they're doing an amazing job. However, when you look at the outcome of the high percentage of children leaving our schools, I mentioned before, functionally innumerate and illiterate, if teaching them as well as that is what you're trying to do and applying for an exemption, to me that, that's not a high bar to go for. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Can I let you into a naughty secret? Oh, please do. Um, how to word this? I used to be an associate minister of education, funnily enough. So that's sort of background to this. I never applied for an exemption on the basis that I felt quite sincerely that I didn't need government's permission to look after my own children. And I thought, I'm not going to play this charade of, mm, dear bureaucrat in the Ministry of Education, I'd quite like to teach my child at home. Uh, will you let me? I'm thinking, who the hell are they, particularly after the bad experiences you can have in the state system? So I refused. Just didn't do it. Couldn't I'd get the form out? Oh, I can't handle this. Anyway, I kept getting letters from the truancy officers. My three children were three of the four hundred children that were truant, and um, it had been handed across to some trust to chase up truancy kids, a married trust, as it happened. And I'd just write to them politely and say, "No, we're all good." I'd say, "Oh, do you want some resources to help?" No, 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 we're all good. You know, all good. And then they just gave up. <laughs> so my kids just got lost in the system, wow. which is pretty funny. And yes. nothing happened. And I was, I, I, um, I thought I'd just wait. And I could imagine, I actually thought it was, I had this funny picture of being arrested and dragged away and screaming, don't let the state educate my kids. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I never applied for that exemption. Have you ever heard of anyone being turned down? Oh, uh, once, I think. Wow. And that was like years ago. Because like what, what happens is, is that if you give insufficient information, yes. they just come back and ask you to explain a bit more or to, to, to flesh out something a bit more. Um, so I do have some advice for, for going for an, an application. That's not a good advice for me, by the way. Do apply. <laughs> well, I think it... Because part of what I wrote here in my notes, Rodney, is that if, I think develop the mindset that you've already had is that you're not asking permission, no. you're telling them. Yes. However, we do live under a rule of law, and mm -hmm. especially if you are wanting perhaps to, to home educate for quite a number of years. I mean, you could mm. probably fly under the radar for a, for a small period of time. Yeah. Uh, so there's that. But for me personally, I wouldn't have been able to cope very well with that emotional stress of, is someone going to knock on my door? Yeah. Um, so so there are the two ways of looking at it. I don't think it's a wise idea to antagonize the Ministry of Education. No. You don't want to draw attention to yourself. No. So when you are filling in your form. Always polite. Yes, you're confident. Use language that they know. Use edu speak like we would refer to it. Yeah, I'm very sorry, but mm, oh, I know exactly what you mean. Yes, yeah, so I think that's important. Don't antagonize the beer. No, no. What you're trying to do is get an exemption. It's not the right time to have a go at somebody because the system is failing. Mm -hmm. Um just, just get on with what you're doing. You're applying for an exemption. Tell them as little as possible in the best possible way. Uh, don't paint yourself into a corner and just be confident. And you can start schooling them at home and be applying for an exemption. Yes, you can. And that's, I think, that was my intention because it's sort of like you don't want to go through the whole palaver and that. You start doing it. Just start and then apply um, would be my suggestion. I remembered what it was, I was, and then I'll shut up. The thing that shocked me about homeschooling was very quickly the kids got used to it. And what I find, and now that they're back at school, if I say, oh, hey, Let's sit down and do some arithmetic. They look at you and say, let's not. <laughs> That's what I do at school, right? Yeah, I sit down and do arithmetic. I've done that at school. Oh, no, no, well, we'll do something. And it's like a fag because it's what they do at school and it's not what they do at home. But I discovered very quickly in the routine, once I got into a routine, 
then sitting down with dad to do arithmetic was what they did. And they just loved it. So it's a funny, it's a funny thing. While they're at school, you can't teach them, but once they're not at school, you can. Does that make sense? Is that, is that a, a common experience? Yes. I, 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 well, I assume it could be because when you're at home, you can, you can curate your curriculum to suit, <clears throat> excuse me, the needs of your child, the giftings of your child, the, the, the weaknesses, the challenges they've got. You, you don't have to lock yourself into particular books or texts or levels that you must teach. So you, so you have that privilege that you can do at home and nobody knows your child like you do. No one. You know if she's not coping well or she can't do her fractions. Incidentally, baking is a great way to learn fractions. Baking is a great way. <laughs> I got so much work done at home because you just get them doing things and you're using numbers all the time. And so I bake bread yes. and I've learned to bake bread. My girls can yes. bake their own bread. Yes. So, um, a common saying amongst the homeschooling approach that we did, which was the Charlotte Mason approach, and we can attack that at a deeper level another day, one of their popular sayings is, the world is your classroom. Mm. So it's not when you open your book or a particular literature book that you have assigned your child or that the, the curriculum has. It's what are you doing around your house? What are the opportunities outside your house? I mean, the great outdoors in New Zealand at the moment is still amazing. A trip to the beach can become marine studies. You see what mm. I did there? <laughs> you, mm -hmm. you put the right words in it. You can go for a walk in the bush and suddenly you're doing native trees and environmental studies. And mm. both of those activities would also come under PE. Is that what they call it still? Physical education. Yes, yes. So the everyday things that you've got around you can become part of how you are teaching your child just through the everydayness of it. And you can choose a really good book, like let's say for your girls, it might be um, Anne of Green Gables. If you had mm -hmm. a little boy, it could be uh, Tom Sawyer. And mm -hmm. out of that one book, you can springboard into nearly everything they need to learn. Mm -hmm. Just simply working out of that one book. That's something we can do in more detail a bit later, if you like. Um, you mentioned things about socialization before and some of the self-doubts that parents would have. And I said that that's all okay. That's normal. I think that's reassuring to know that it's normal. The socialization thing, because that's one of the first comebacks you'll get from people once they know you're homeschooling. And we used to just smile at each other and call it the S word, you know. But it's like some days, it's, well, I think we better stay home today, kids, and get some book work done. <laughs> um, and I'm quoting Sarah Ferrant again. She talked about this. Isn't and it's she a more, wonderful woman? Oh, she's, she's amazing. She's inspirational. And mm. I've got... Two interviews from her, incidentally, one reflecting on her homeschooling days and the other about being a chiropractor, if that's a career you'd like to go into. Mm. But she talks socialization about more about being uh, civilization. You are civilizing your child. You referred earlier in, in our discussion about the bullying going on in school. If that's a reflection of some of the socialization going on in the schools, and we know it is. That's not how I want my child socialized. No. It's the only situation in our modern life where we're, we're divided up according to age. That will never happen in your life again. And a child needs to be civilized by having around them a variety of ages from little ones younger than them, babies, toddlers that they can help look after and teach, right through to older children and into their teens that they can look to as mentors and also be cared for um, by them, teaching them, but also that the concept, Rodney, of, of deliberately bringing into your homeschool experience older people, especially our elderly, who are walking encyclopedias and mm. historical, little mobile historical units, the things that you can ask them. They can mentor your, your children. There is huge educational potential in just sitting down and getting this older person to tell them about their childhood. What do they remember? 
Do they remember their own grandparents? And before you know it, you've probably got about 150 years of history just by sitting down and asking that older person. So so I put all that under socialization because that uh, is going to give your child the, the biggest opportunity to blossom out um, because they're dealing with, with people and of all ages and experiences that's going to push their boundaries out of how they see the world and how they deal with people. It's And it's just there. They... When they, there's, I know locally, there's a group of homeschoolers who meet up and then take turns at looking after their kids. And that strikes me as very important, if that's your thing, because it gets tough 24-7 with your kids. Mm. And so if you could network in your community with other homeschoolers, it might be one, two, three families. That must be a help and a comfort. Yes, and and practical as well, because you're right, Rodney. Um, It's one of those um, mistaken dreams, I think, that if you think you can be around your children (laughs) 24-7 and remain sane... um, (laughs) You know, I'll give you two weeks at homeschooling and then check in with you because it's not, um, no. it's not 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 reality. So you you do get wonderful support from each other, and some of our children's best times were when they were you know running around with with their friends. Some of whom I might point out they had no idea how old some of their friends were, and the mums would be around. Yes, yes, yes. and the mums would be with each other. Um, the other thing that amazes me about school, and I've got a thing about waste. I hate waste. And I can't stand that we have all these schools and buildings, and they literally get used four hours a day or five hours a day, right? And then stand empty. And the German, of oh, Often there are things after school and that, but you know what I mean. And then the school holidays come along. And it just drives me nuts because you think, gosh, you could have a school, you know, anywhere. But we have this concept, it's got to be a school with all these facilities. And then you say to yourself, well, they're actually only sitting in class, learning for an hour and a half or so a day practically. It takes me an hour to get my kids to school, right? What I found was lessons would be over in that hour. You know, the whole palaver, you look at a school and the whole palaver of getting kids to school, picking up and getting them home, and you think, that's a big, big Parents are doing such a lot to get their kids to school these days with the traffic, with the distance. And you think it sort of behoves the school to be making it all work. And when you find they're not, oh, my goodness, isn't that bus ride or car ride or walk through the traffic or whatever? A lot of learning could be going on rather than just turning up dumbly to school. Mm-hmm. And once you've, oh, I was going to say escape that, I don't mean that in a um, patronising sense, but especially if you've been at school and then you come home, you do realise that and and it does um, come across you as that how lovely to be at home when everybody else is, you know, out in the weather or in the in the traffic. And looking at the clock, and, it's 8 o'clock, you know, oh, get, the get your shoes the on. Rush, rush, rush. Mm. Yeah. Tell me yeah. one concern that you could have is you say, well, I don't know what my child will want to be. They may want to be a medical doctor, an accountant, a lawyer. 
And if that would be a marvellous thing, but if that's the case, then they have to tick along at school, pass exams, and get to university and pass the exams. Now, if I'm homeschooling, am I pulling them out of that opportunity for that professional development, education and training? Because at some point, they have to enter the system and be in the system and succeed in the system. They can't be homeschooled to become a medical doctor. So at some point, they have to transition from homeschool to something else, to the system. How does that work? Or maybe, because they're being homeschooled, they're very good at baking and feeding the chickens and running on the beach, but it never even occurs to them that they could be a medical doctor because that's something that their peers are talking about and are in the system and the teachers are talking about, but meanwhile, Junior is feeding chooks with mum. How does that work? Oh, well, it's possibly playing into an assumption rather than reality. It certainly wasn't like that for us. And um, so you say, yes, they've got to finish homeschooling and go into the into the system someday. True. We had five children that we uh, took all the way through to the end of high school. We didn't know if that's what we would do in the beginning, but we ended up doing that. Three out of five of them never went to school. Uh, all of them went to university. Wow. And all of them, with the exception of one, their first exam was at university. So did that put them behind? No. We coached them through how to sit an exam so that when that first one came around, they were just as equipped as anybody else to do it. You see, if you go backwards over your homeschooling journey, what, what you set out to do, or what my husband and I set out to do, was to raise um, independent young adults who knew how to think, not what to think. So it was our job to make sure they were proficient in, in math to whatever degree were their interests and giftings and that they were proficient in the English language to read and write, that they had been exposed to all kinds of cultural opportunities right throughout the years. Um, where we uh, had weaknesses, like math is not my forte. So we would uh, pay for a math tutor for the children once they started going through their middle high school onwards. Um, and one of them needed uh, to, to go to a tutor to learn how to put her um, English essays and things together. Um, sorry. Uh, sorry, Rodney. And um, so that, no, they, they weren't disadvantaged by being at home. In fact, because we had taught them to know how to do their own research, to work unsupervised and independently, they were so equipped they, they could go out and do anything they wanted. And I know homeschooling um, children who, who have gone out and into medicine um, or into any other professional career. Some of them will go into a career outside of the university system, which is a reasonably recent thing. And perhaps we can talk about that at some stage, the options there. So it, it does not disadvantage them in any way. They have so much available to them if they homeschool even right through to the end. And I might just pop in two, just out of interest, is that our children did all this without having NCEA going through that system. My goodness. Mm, it's very doable. How did they find university? Um, they didn't... It, it wasn't like a shock to them. They were able to, they were excited about it. They each ended up going into directions that we knew that they were interested in because as you grow your child up through homeschooling, you can see what their interests and what they're drawn to and what they're really good at. Um, so when they went to university, they, they, they got in easily. They managed their work and their assignments all well. When they needed help, they'd go and ask for it. And they all got their degrees. 
um, you know, they're in the system as functioning, responsible adults. We did our and job how did well. They, <laughs> how did they regard this homeschooling experience? There would be a variety amongst all of our, our children. Some would um, say that it was the best thing that they, they did. Some aren't so sure. And then I think there would be some who would have quite liked to have had a go at, at, at school with something. But mostly there is more positive than negative feedback that we're mm. getting from them. And I think that's important to also know is that there is no one way of educating a child that is totally perfect, that doesn't have some negatives or things you might regret or things that you wish could have been done better. Mm. But it's a long life and they will find their way through. And with your help and love and support, uh, particularly the mothers, because um, – they can easily waste a year or two or three or ten at school. And so it's not like one bad day or one bad week is the ruination of it. Um, and you, it's that great English thing. We muddle through, don't we? That we, we get do. presented with a problem and we think, oh, I'm not sure about this. And then we deal with it as it comes up rather than we sit back and we try and plan it all at the start and all the things, how to get everything right. You better just to jump in and start swimming. Yes. And 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 I've learned everything. This is one of the things that I have learned. I used to be sort of think there was a need for goals because that's how you get taught. You know, you've got to have a goal and you think, oh, well, I'm going to – do this and get to X and when I get to X life will be good because I'll have X or I've achieved X and I realise that actually the wonderful part is the process of getting to X so the great thing about homeschooling is not, or having children for that matter, isn't about getting them to X, it's actually the very process of going mm -hmm. through it and it's easy to forget that, that it's the enjoyment of the of the journey. And you're doing a wonderful journey with your children. It's an adventure too. Yeah, together. Yeah. Mm. What about nanas and granddads? Oftentimes, sadly, we live apart from nanas and granddads or in another town or another country. But it's always struck me that Nannas and granddads would be great homeschoolers. Does that happen? I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming it does. I, I couldn't give you any anecdotal stories about that. I, I do recall in our homeschooling days sometimes that Nana or granddad would, would arrive at a sports club or to a, a lesson or something and it would be the, the grandparent bringing the, the child along. So there was definitely involvement in it. Mm. And it certainly would be a very easy thing to do um, for, you know, great for the children, great for the mum especially, but also a wonderful time for the for the grandparents who mm. are often, you know, you feel like you may have reached your use by date by the time you're into <laughs> into that that period of life. So to have the the opportunity now to come and have an active part like that in your grandchild's life. Is a, is, a, is a wonderful privilege. There would be some some very basic things that uh, grandparents and the parents would have to have understandings on. Um, so, for instance, um, the grandparents would need to be agreeing with how the parents were wanting to raise and educate their children, um, not undermining what they were trying to do because they think they could do it better. So there does mm. have to be a, a good agreement there. Get that right and balanced, and and I think that will be just synergy, isn't that the greatest? Yes, part? and it might be a part time mm -hmm. thing, right? That you know, oh yeah. In the afternoons, granddad takes the kids, or something like that, or nana, or one day a week, or something. And um, the other great thing is trips, right? Because you can just on a whim 
as you say, go for a hike, go for a trip in the car, take a camping trip around New Zealand, and that becomes yes. a home school. It does. It, it absolutely does. And especially where there's a grandparent involved, often they've got crafts and skills mm. that aren't maybe practiced so much now, which is an ideal opportunity not to spend that wonderful time together, not just that, but also to be teaching them and imparting this knowledge that gets carried on down through into generations and talking to them all the while too about telling them what life was like when when they were a little girl or a little boy mm. what they remember of their grandparents too and just very very easily and almost anecdotally you are building into that child um a heritage of of mm. knowledge it's quite amazing that because i can remember my great grandfather and he was born in 1882 which is extraordinary right that you can stretch that far and I can remember talking to him and I can well remember World War I veterans and World War II veterans were a dime a dozen they were like our school teachers and now you talk to your children about that. And it's like, whoa, you know, that's like Julius Caesar's time. <laughs> it's just, just impossible for them to imagine. The olden that, days. That length of time. And yet, and for a child to have time with a grandparent is a wonderful thing for both. Mm. Truly wonderful, wonderful thing. The you'll have to. I had a thought and it's gone. You'll have to say something, Christine, because I'm stuck <laughs> on what I was about to say. All right. Can I just assure people that over their homeschooling days, there are some amazing days, absolutely fantastic days, where you think, "Oh, this is." Fabulous, this is going to be the way it is. And there's a few what I would call black days. They're the days that you need to really know your why, incidentally. But mostly the days, they're just days, and you just get on and do it. And if you think that these amazing, beautiful, fantastic days are going to be normal, you're going to be um, somewhat disappointed. A little bit like if you think the, the romantic experiences you have with your spouse should be your normal everyday thing for marriage, you're going to get pretty disheartened pretty mm. quickly. They're lovely when they come, but it's not an everyday thing. Um, I think that's a good thing also for um, parents to know. The other thing that I would say right from the beginning about getting started is that you don't need to go out and buy a curriculum. In fact, I suggest you don't. Um, don't go out spending lots of money because you think you've got to buy textbooks and maths books and, and all of the readers from you know for the, for the ages that they need. I, I would suggest just taking your time about things until you know what you actually want to do. Some people do like to buy a box curriculum. And we had that for our first year. But for the rest of our years, we did that that other approach called the Charlotte Mason Method. So just get yourself a couple of really good literature books. They're called living books. Those, you know, those old ones written in the olden mm. days. The Tom Sawyers and Pollyanna and um, Anne of Green Gables. Jane Austen, if you've got older children. That kind of reading I'm thinking of. So, for instance, Enid Blyton and Harry Potter might be nice books and interesting to read and the kids might want to read them, but for our kids, they were books that they read in their own time. They didn't meet the uh, the bar of being literature books. So you have yourself some really good literature books, get yourself a very basic math books and some manipulatives and just go and start your homeschooling like that. Even if you are waiting for your exemption to come through, as you mentioned earlier, just start. Mm. I had, have you heard of a Mr. Chun Tain? Yes. Yes, I used to, I had his book, uh, Teach Your Children Well, I think yes. it's called. Yes. Yes. He was a friend of mine. Oh, yes. 
And he was a Malaysian Chinese in Christchurch who was an electrical engineer and loved maths and started to teach his kids maths. And it became a big thing. I forget the children's names or the order. Michael was one, a younger one. And the first child turned up to university at 16 and went straight into stage two honours physics. He ended up having the youngest one at university at 13. And everyone thought these kids were like, and they all went on and had a stunning careers. And I knew the children, and they were good at sport, good all-round kids, happy kids. And everyone thought the kids were genius. And as he would explain, they weren't. He just said, maths actually is easy. <laughs> It's not hard, right? You have to put a lot of energy in to learn it. And he ended up full-time teaching. And he'd get flown over to Singapore and they'd video him and his system became in the Singaporean system. Here in New Zealand, he was blacklisted by oh, the teacher why? union. Oh, because he was showing them up. Teacher unions, oh. Ministry of Education, he was to be avoided at all costs. He would take friends of mine's children who were bottom of the class in maths and failing, and literally within three sessions, they'd be top of the class. My son used to go to him on a Saturday morning, and it was the highlight of my son's week, was to go to Mr. Chun Tan and learn maths. And he was a friend of mine, I was a friend of mine. And I would study what he did. And I read his book. And I used it. And it was shockingly simple. And it's been the greatest gift I've had with my children. Because I do it with everything. So, when I was a kid, and you'd come home and you'd sweated and laboured over a little bit of writing, and you'd show it to your mum, and she'd read it, and she'd say, oh, you misspelled that word. And you'd be crushed, <laughs> right? Absolutely crushed. And I've learned through Mr. Chun Tan never to do that. So I read my children's writing with all the mistakes in it, so oh, that's so wonderful, because what you... What you realise through Mr. Chun Tan was that creativity and imagination that went into the creation of that es essay, that's the essence that you want to preserve. They will always learn to spell correctly. And even if they don't, it doesn't matter that much. But they will learn. But what they lose is that enthusiasm and creativity or sense that they're doing good. And what he does with kids learning maths is he simply takes it back to what they can do. So he might have a 14-year-old come in and he'll just get a pen and paper. This is to encourage people to teach, teach their kids. And he'd go, oh, What's, you know the answer to this, one plus two? Yeah, 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 I know the answer to that, three. Oh, okay. And then he just asked questions. And he would never say they were wrong. He'd just say, well, what about this? Or what about that? And they just lit up. Because it's that idea of being marked wrong. Right? Obviously they're wrong, right? But they're learning. And they're learning through their mistakes. And his little book and his style, and I saw it in action, it would just light up. And it wasn't magic. It was just that philosophy of getting a kid to, sitting with a kid in that very intense moment when a young mind can learn faster than it can at 
any other time in your life. You can just learn in 10 minutes, you can learn such a lot. And he would capture that and bottle it and replicate it over and over and over again. His kids weren't doing a lot of maths, right? But when they did it, they were learning at a huge rate. When I went to school, we just learned to be bored and to sit still and shut up. It's like, God, if this is life, I, I wish it was over. <laughs> Looking at the clock, when does it get to three o'clock? And oh my God, it's not like that now in the same way. But it's that thing that any parent could do. That's what Mr. Chun Tan taught me. Any parent can do that. Don't sit there telling them what they did wrong. Just sit there helping them to learn the right answer. And funny enough, a teacher struggles to do that because she or he's got a class. But a parent can do it with love and support. A parent is highly motivated to do it. Highly motivated. I am... Um, talk too much but it's a topic that is so wonderful and I suspect our schools aren't going to change until parents demand it or they vote with their feet so anyone anyone who's remotely thinking of homeschooling your kids, give it a whirl. But if you give it a whirl, I don't know about you, Christine, but my advice would be to do it for at least one or two terms. It's no loss to the child if they're young. First well, term, I... I Sorry, first, term I, I we did, missed... first term, we just oh. played, and then we slowly ah. introduced teaching. Yes. We didn't say, day one, whole term of just playing and they were funny enough learning and then we did a little introduced it my god it was wonderful and i think it boosted them and they went back to school positive because they were ahead of the other kids mm. Mm. you only have to be ahead of the other kids in arithmetic and suddenly you're brainy i taught my kids that too <laughs> learn to beat everyone at chess and you'll be considered the brains of the class and it becomes reinforcing right the brain, you, you. But I think to, to give you a gift of joy back to your children for education, mm. because you know, like I, I heard from your some of your stories from when you're at school, I, I feel like I was I was robbed of so much opportunity. I, I learned not to ask questions because if if I was taken any notice of, even by the teacher, um, the kids might laugh at me because I didn't know the answer so mm. the amount of things I just let go when I could have asked and I was too afraid to such a shame do you know that song there's a wonderful wonderful song about the first hundred digits of pi no oh google it okay it's a beautiful song of these guys singing and it's here we go counting pi and my kids used to sing that every day for some reason like this is just last year i'd never heard of it and it's a it's a song that is very catchy um it's actually set to some classic music which i forget it's just a funny story <laughs> because <laughs> my little girl came home from school and <laughs> it's pie day in america or something the teacher said which is what is it three they do the month three twelve three point one two or something. Anyway, they had to work out how many numbers, how many digits of pi they could. <laughs> and my daughter did thirty. <laughs> Good for her. <laughs> <laughs> she could remember the song. She said, "Oh, the kids have been going quiet. I could have got to the hundred, but I kept getting distracted and forgetting the song." So, <laughs> can you imagine it? This little girl writes by to 30 digits. And so she's considered a podgy and she had to explain to the teacher, no, no, she just learned the song. But that's a sort of example, isn't it? 
I mean, a trivial thing of learning pi to 100 digits, but it's so, when she did it, it was, oh, gosh, Grace, you're so amazing. And then she just comes home full of joy of the positivity of being positively reinforced. And it's so easy to take a little kid and crush them. Yes. yes. And when you crush them, it doesn't come back quickly. And there are kids that get crushed over and over and over just by even you can do it oblivious. You can be oblivious to what you're saying and doing. Teachers can be oblivious to it. Little mm, sensitive. Mm. Some kids are so sensitive, others aren't. Other kids can take it. Mm. Um, I, I find it um, heartbreaking because they have such a lot of potential. And as you say, it can be robbed. Mm. Homeschooling, though. I have been talking. I've got to stop because I'm musing on a favorite topic and I'm going to get texts and emails saying, Rodney, 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 you talk too much. And poor Christine had such a lot to say. She's the one with all the experience and you wanted to yak, yak, yak about your life. You're a narcissist or something. I don't know. But, but, I, but I will be back, Rodney. You will be back and I will learn to shut up because that's probably everything I know about homeschooling done. But all I want to do is just encourage anyone that's thinking of homeschooling is to jump in and give it a whirl. The, you can always go back to school, but you'll only have one opportunity to spend some days with your child. Yes. Yes. So do it. Yes. Yes. I've been talking to Christine Smith. You're on rallycheck.radio. Ah, I said dot. You can email me at inbox at radleycheck.radio. You can text me at 2057. Have questions for Christine Smith. Christine Smith is very experienced. She does podcasts that broadcast around the world on homeschooling. She's got a web page, which I've forgotten. Well, What's I should give you the YouTube channel too, shouldn't I, Rodney? Absolutely. They can. It's coming home Survive and Thrive in Homeschooling. That's on YouTube. Coming home, Survive, survive and Thrive and in thrive Homeschooling. And, homeschooling. Mm. and then your webpage? Comminghomeinfo.com. And we will put this in the link. So if you go to the show on RCR webpage, you will see the links. Christine's going to become a regular. We're going to have a list of topics that we're going to work through for homeschooling. I hope it's of interest to others because, in a way, we're all homeschooling because all of us are teaching our kids and our grandkids and we're taking some responsibility. So it's of interest even if you aren't homeschooling. And I'm not homeschooling in the sense my kids go to school, but, oh, my goodness, I try and teach them at every opportunity. And we, I keep an eye on what they're learning. And this will be part of it too. And you can pick up any gaps and you can cover it. By the way, Christine, how wonderful is it to read a great book like Tom Sawyer with a child? Oh, it's great. Yes. Yes, because a good child's book is also a good adult's book. I made a mistake with my daughter. Because I said, let's read Lord of the Flies. And we're reading it, the two of us. And we read it quietly, like we do a chapter each day. And um, she's a quick reader like me. And then she looks up and she says, Dad, it's pretty dark. <laughs> Wait till they're a bit older for Lord of the Flies. Oh, Lord my goodness. Okay, Christine Smith, thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you so much for beaming in all the way from England. And thank you so much to your husband, Andrew, for his wonderful book on apolog apologetics. Oh, my goodness. I hope he's writing some more. I hope so, too. That would be mm. good. There you go. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, Rodney. Bye-bye. With your help, we can continue to fight for freedom. 
This is not possible without your generosity. Join our quest for the truth and our freedom 